Excuse me, Jeff. Could we have you come up here and talk about your international programs? Just to round off this whole discussion about dissexing, Jeff's just going to sum up the international programs he's been involved in and show you a few slides for a nice sort of light end to the afternoon. Um, but please feel free to keep writing if you need to because we want to collect those forms um, at five o'clock before we go off to have our cocktails. Thank you. Okay, this is uh, kind of, a, it, they're just going to be flashing slides up here and you can kind of watch them. And uh, I think I'm supposed to be talking about what I've seen or what we do internationally. And uh, I'll just introduce a program and uh, have never introduced it uh, publicly in this kind of forum, but um, I call it Spay It Forward. Um, bottom line is I have two clinics, one in Slovakia and one in Mexico. I'm probably going to go to the Philippines or Thailand next. And I put $550,000 into Slovakia. I got about close to $400,000 into Mexico. Both clinics were built for profit. Both clinics are highly profitable. Both clinics have quite a few employees that are paid far above the average. My Mexican veterinarians are in the top 10% of income in their nation. Uh, my Slovakian veterinarians are the same. Point being, you can build clinics and make them profitable just about anywhere in the world if you pick the right locations and know what you're doing and get efficient at spay and neuter. Uh, and these, the, the deal is I'll build them, I'll uh, you know, equip them, and then they run them and I give them away. They, it becomes theirs. You know, over time, I just sign everything over to them. And the deal is they pay me back. No interest. Um, if they can't make money this year, they can't afford it, they don't pay me. So the odds are I'll be dead before I ever get paid back. <laughs> but that's not a problem because the bottom line is they're going to commit that money to my nonprofit, uh, Planned Pet International. And the idea is I build more clinics. Every few years we build another clinic, and then they pay back. So ideally when I get four or five or six clinics and they're all paying five to ten to $20,000 a year back into the nonprofit, it will keep on perpetuating itself long after I'm dead. Um, and I think it's a good approach for for profits. I also think it's a good approach for nonprofits that you know, like the international ones. They should be doing this all over the place too, because you have to lift people up. You cannot go into a third world nation and be whitey, you know, going down to Mexico and saying you have to spay and neuter your animals, and I'm here to make your life better. Okay? They don't trust, and they, they just it's not the right approach. I always try to work from, with, from within. When I go to Native American reservations, I will not go to a reservation unless I'm invited by the tribal council. That's kind of the governing body, and that's just where you start. Now, clearly, the tribal council usually are more politicians. They don't know anything about spay and neuter or really you know, what's going on, and it's usually pressure from people like you um, or you know, people like the neutering brigade people who say, you know, we have a, a problem, we have a dog bite problem, we have this kind of a problem, and they put pressure on the tribal council, so the tribal council invites me in. Um, I think it's important within work within the culture of the people. I think it's real important to look at uh, the big picture in terms of what's the history of uh, the dog with a certain tribe. You know, an example I always give is, this, is the tale of Emi Tall which is the Blackfeet Indian. The first time I went there, we kind of researched it and we came up with a, a coloring book which told the story of Amy Tall, which is of a dog that, that warns the tribe of danger and the, the dog turns into a warrior and the warrior marries the princess of the tribe and everything was happily ever after. And that was the coloring book. And the point is, most of the children didn't even know their own legend. You know, this went back hundreds of years, and it was just one of the tribal elders that we happened to speak to that was kind of saying, you know, like, what do you, what's your view of animals? What's it, you know, what, what's going on here? What's the past? Well, you know, do you have a history with dogs? And he, he elaborated this whole story, which we wrote down, and then we, and we made it into a coloring book. Um, those are the kind of things that are important, and those are the kind of things where you make real differences really fast. Um, I think the Spay It Forward program uh, will work. I think there's very few countries where people aren't receptive, even places like Korea where they eat dogs. You know, you can say, well, you know, if you're not going to fix them, you can always eat them. Um, you know, it, it really, there are people everywhere making differences. And I think the key is to give them ownership 
and I think that's the most important thing. People have to have some concept of ownership. Uh, and I don't mean ownership in that this is my dog. I mean ownership in the process, in the process of you're giving them avenues out. Um, I, as I said earlier, you know, when I was first started working in Mexico, I was told, you know, may, you'll never neuter male dogs and people won't bring tree pubes to you. And it just hasn't been true. Everywhere I went, no matter it's Poland, Turkey, India, I, there's just never been an issue with not enough animals to do. There's always been an issue with too many. Too many people stand in line too long, you just run out. You know, you get to seven, eight, nine, ten o'clock at night and you're, you're worn out and you can't do anymore. Um, that's the issue most places I go. Well, how is that in a culture that doesn't respect animals? It's, it's not that they don't respect animals, they don't have the resources. And as several slides demonstrated today, the people that they were reaching on some of these programs, 92% 80 to 90 percent, 80 to 95 percent are the classic numbers and they're well documented in many studies throughout the world. Uh, and when you do low cost to free stuff, and most of the things I do are free uh, to the general public and we figure out how to fund them. But you know, when you're doing the free stuff, you know, 80, 90 percent of those people have never taken an animal to a veterinarian. Does that mean they don't care about the animal? No, it means that's the resources they have. You know, and, and in fact, if I would, I would submit if they're going to sit in line for eight or ten or twelve hours to get their animal fixed, then they must care something. You know, they they've essentially taken a day out of their life. Now maybe their life's really boring and all they're doing is sitting at home anyway. I don't know, but you know they certainly show up. They certainly seem interested, and they certainly seem to get involved. Um, I think one thing that makes my program different. You know, both in Mexico and in Slovakia, we, when I build these clinics, I always put an extra bedroom and an extra bathroom. And the deal is, well, it's a free place for me to stay, so that's one of the deals. But the main deal is, if we have someone that's trying to come to, to say, someone from the Ukraine come, wants to come to the States for me to train them, I can't get a Ukrainian into the, USA, in the States. It's just not going to happen, especially after 9-11. It's really hard to get certain countries in. Um, and certainly they think they're not going to go back. So if you're a male that's not married and you don't have property, there's no way they're going to let you come in the United States for a training program. So, um, you know, what I say, then you go to Slovakia. And if you're from Panama and you can't get up, I'll send you to Mexico. So our, our, our facilities are used as training facilities. And the vets I've picked and have trained are part of my family. I mean, they really are. Uh, Tony, the head vet in Mexico, is, is uh, he considers me his father, you know. Um, so they're just incredible human beings. And that's the beauty of what we do and the people we get to work with, is you look around here, excuse me, you look around here and you get to know your neighbors. I mean, they're really caring, compassionate, you know, compelling people with a worldview. And uh, uh, Dr. Hudik from um, um, the head vet, my head vet in Slovakia, is came up under communism, and you know he always talks about the the uh, the fall of the Berlin Wall as as this revolution. I said, what revolution are you talking about? He says, the, you know, it was when the Berlin Wall fell in '89, and they didn't even teach small animal medicine until '92. And when what, and essentially what they did is take the large animal horse doctor and say, okay, now you're a dog doctor, and the large animal pig doctor, now you're the cat doctor, and they just shifted drugs and everything over. And when I first started working in Slovakia, 50% of the animals that went in for sterilization died, 50%. You think most people were standing in line to get their animals fixed? You know, not hardly. So, you know, it's changed in the last 15 years dramatically, and we have the shelter contract. We have worked with three different nonprofit groups, and we have a very, very profitable clinic there. Uh, and it can be done. You can do welfare work and make money at the same time. And if you are a welfare organization that's open a community clinic, you should be able to make money with a community clinic. And if you're not, you need to step back and figure out why you're not. You can pay vets very good money, and I'm all for getting paid. Um, you can, you know, but you should be able, that's a Jain bed, by the way. Jainism is one of the oldest religions in the world. And I don't think I'd want to sleep on that bed, but that's what that was. <laughs> Um, and this is in Panama, uh, that is in India. So, and those are goats, so you imagine how big of a monolith that is for cutting. So these are you know, just pictures from different places all over the world, and your typical street dog, they're all about the same everywhere. Um, point being is you are only limited by your imagination, and you are definitely, I, I know one thing I teach my kids, uh, and I. I coach distance running and I, I coach ultra running. People run 100-mile 100, 100 races and 50-mile races. And 
uh, one of the one of the quotes we always say is, "You are stronger than you think you are, and you can do more than you think you can." And there's probably no field that you can be in that's probably more depressing on any given day, because sometimes things just really suck. You know, things die. You have to put things to sleep. You see things. In my own clinic, because I deal with a very high volume and a lot of lower income people, the things I see on a weekly basis just infuriate me. And if I didn't go out and run or do something exercise wise, I would probably go postal and start shooting people, quite frankly. Uh, you know, and, and they would be deserving of it, in my opinion. Uh, but, you know, I mean, I don't, you saw a picture a while back there of that dog with the mouth with all the rotten teeth, you know. I mean, that didn't get like that overnight. You know, that is not good husbandry for that animal. Now, the people didn't have much better teeth either. So it's really hard while I can be outraged at that moment, then I go meet the person and realize, okay, their life isn't even better. You know, so you do have to put, you do have to step back from time to time and put things in perspective. And the one thing I always ask is, you know, walk a mile in their shoe. You know, people make bad choices all the time. And poor people and undereducated people make a lot more bad choices, in my opinion. <laughs> you know, but that's part of the circumstances of their life. I wouldn't trade my life for their life, you know. And at some point, compassion has to come in. And it's easy for us sometimes. My wife is very good at losing compassion with people and keeping it with the animals. And I think it has to go hand in hand. Because number one, we're not going to change the life of those animals without having some impact it may not it may be a minimal impact but you can have a positive interaction with a kind of a bad person that you might consider a bad person or not a good owner you can still make it a positive interaction and hopefully it'll make some difference in that animal and that person's life you don't have to treat people like dirt you don't have to treat poor people like they're poor people i get comments all the time like why don't you screen you know why don't you i think you guys talk about some kind of card you have is there a card to, sh to show your a lower income or, or, yeah, okay, you know, I mean, we have the same kind of thing. I never have done that. And, and the one thing I realized being a student for so many years, you know, you always have to stand in line and show cards. I'm like, who, you know, it, it's demeaning in many ways. So someone comes in and say, well, okay, our price is this, I can't afford that. Well, okay, prove to me you're poor. You know, prove to me that you are low life, you know, lower income. And because that's what you're saying indirectly in a lot of ways. And vets really, you know, as, uh, that's the one thing I feel like the vet community has lost it in that they go back and say, okay, you need to be able to, you know, show that these people are in need. And one of the examples given earlier was the person that had the very expensive car. Okay, I've had people come up in Mercedes for their $5 cat neuter. Okay, now did that bother me? Sure, you know, I mean, it really kind of made me a little upset. But the truth is, the value they put on that animal was $5, you know. I've gone into communities where the vets have taken out newspaper ads and saying, okay, this vet's from out of town. You're, you know, they basically said, don't go to this vet. The money's going to leave our, our town, small community. It's going away. And you know what I usually do is I usually call the vets and say, thank you very much for the advertisement because instead of having 40 animals booked, we end up with 140 animals booked because people are standing in line. And you're doing 8, 9, 10, 11, 12-year-old female dogs Okay, and so my position is, look, if this is such a great community and you're so involved in your community, why is it that I'm doing 12 and 13 year old female dogs and they've been here for the last 12 or 13 years and you haven't done them yet? And if you, you know, I mean, I'm not going to say that they, they don't care about those animals, but they have their prices. And the truth is price is a major factor, without a doubt, in doing anything in veterinary medicine. It's a major factor in human medicine. You know, now we may have insurance and things like that, but obviously we don't have a lot of that with dogs and certainly lower income people don't have that. So I think you can have tremendous differences uh, with the vet community, but in the long run, our goal should be the same. And we just have to understand from a veterinary standpoint, there's certain clients that most vets really don't want. And those are the clients you really do want to get to. I'm not saying you want them, but you need to get to them. And that's, that's the reality of it. But just from the standpoint of, of the whole world, I, I do believe, um, you know, globalization, I hate to say it, Animal Planet has just made a tremendous difference. I, I speak a lot of universities around the world, 
with kids and it's just amazing what they know that they just didn't know five and ten years ago and how much more motivated they are. Now they don't have the resources, you know, and I'm not sure. I'm, I would like to see a lot of these international groups do a lot more with providing resources. We're looking at possibly opening a, a clinic in Cancun um, funded by some rich people, but essentially to do the same thing in terms of a, a clinic where you they go out and do mobile stuff, but they have a base clinic for in the poor area of town, you know? And I, I think it's a model that can work, and that's why I kind of like both. You know, I do like stationary facilities. Stationary facilities give you cred, as they say, in, in the inner city. You know, you have to have credibility, so that's the cred, you know? Because the vets, for me, for the first couple of years when I was doing everything mobile, well, you have no overhead. That's why he does everything for so cheap. My cat spay price in my facility is $40, and my cat neuter price is $30. I consider that high. Okay, and I'm kind of ashamed of it, quite frankly. We just raised them up uh, recently. So, but there's so many cat groups right now, the number of cats we do have really dropped considerably. If you bring me a 60 kilogram dog in heat, you're probably looking at $100, you know. Um, so, it, it, you know, and, and I'm talking, I have pulse oxes, I have heated surgery tables, uh, everything is tubed, uh, you know, they're on isofluorine. So, I'm not sure what the difference, I don't know how you go from $100 to $500. I mean, I just don't know how you do it. You know, I mean, and, and I guess I never will. I've never worked for anybody else. I've only worked for myself. So I don't, I don't know if that makes me stupid or smart, quite frankly. But, you know, I, I, it's, I have, don't begrudge anyone making money without a doubt. And let's, once again, assume for a second that I like money and I don't mind. I, I'd rather have money than not have money. Um, but I got to believe there's a balance there. But not all vets are concerned about social issues, you know, and I would go so, so far to say is not all people in our society are concerned about social issues, you know, so you do have to pick and choose, and I, and I don't think I would be negative towards vets who don't want to participate, but I would not pick a fight with them, and I would not give them the time of day. I would just move on to the ones who are interested and know that there's more positive things on the horizon than negative things, and that's where I'm going to leave you, if that's all right.